cool. So we're talking about EMFs and stuff. I'm pressing record so we could dive into it and then we'll loop back. Yeah, to- we got started talking early. Uh, but so you're up. Yeah, so EMFs in Europe, like um, uh, a lot of European countries have um, laws that uh, forbid Wi-Fi signals within a certain um, yeah. uh, distance from schools so that kids don't get... I, oh, they were that. doing... Uh, where was it? So I read the book... Um, the non Tim foil guide to EMFs, <laughs> which is such a good title. It's yeah. like, uh, he's from Toronto. I think he's French Canadian, Nicholas yeah. Bonneau. And they, in it, he references a study where like teachers were turning off Wi-Fi when the kids would get rowdy mm-hmm. and they would calm down Yeah, mm-hmm. and all the ADD would go away. And I'm like, of course, like, yeah, yeah everyone's there. It's like four times more permeable to EMFs than, human or then humans then adults because of the fact that adults have the thicker skull and the less permeable brain matter yeah um yeah i love that title because uh like when i first started discovering how it was affecting me personally um my boyfriend at the time went apeshit on me he hated turning off the wi-fi even if it was at night and he was like asleep and he gets cell cell reception on his phone just fine he would yell at me for turning it off even though he wasn't using it and um, it was really difficult to get him to agree, even though like he knew that I was suffering from like really mm-hmm. severe insomnia. I mean, I, I literally could not sleep until after the sun came up and then I would sleep for like two hours, three maybe at most in the daytime. And so when I discovered, and luckily one time he went on a, on a business trip and I turned off all the devices in the house. I think I mentioned this in my book. And um, it... Uh, I slept so well that night. And this was like the first of my yeah. health like progress. I was still really sick with cancer and recovering from alcoholism. Actually, I don't think I, no, I hadn't even started to get sober yet. And so um, even with that, I still slept all night long, probably from pure exhaustion, but because all of the Wi-Fi stuff was turned off, even though I was still that sick, I was able to sleep. And, uh, but he treated me like I was crazy for like, yeah. <laughs> and but and then I like we got in this argument. And I sent him like this list of like twenty different studies that specifically yeah. show EMS effects on um, different cellular processes, and showing him how I'm not. There's lots of documented evidence about this, mm-hmm. besides the fact that you know I just can't sleep when it happens. And it was weird too. Cause I would get to the other side of the house, way away from the Wi-Fi station where our um our tv and sofa were and i would like fall asleep on the sofa and i'd be like oh good i'm rested i'm gonna fall asleep again then i would go in the bedroom and i just couldn't go back to sleep and it was so strange Um, oh yeah i noticed even um that (laughs) so he snored really bad (laughs) like really bad like just like earth shattering and i was probably i was more aware i snore too though Uh, but i was um more aware of it because i couldn't sleep so so the slightest little sound would wake me up and his it would just shake our bedroom and um uh one night i was really sneaky and i he'd already fallen asleep and i turned off his phone and all the wi-fi in the house and he stopped snoring oh my god it was the weirdest thing like completely stopped snoring yeah and i tried to tell him that and he <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh i mean i uh with my ex-girlfriend when i would sleep at her place she was in chicago it's a smaller area like the apartments cost a ton oh, to yeah, like yeah. la really small the wi-fi router's right there it's a smart yeah. tv right there which always has to be on and then and all your neighbors and the charging plugs directly next to the bed and the phones are plugged into the charging plugs and mine's on airplane. The other's not, yeah. I couldn't sleep. I would get maybe three hours, but every morning I'd be like, this is how people live. I was like, I can't believe this is how people live. But one of the, so reading that book, he started to go into what we're going to talk about a lot today, which is autism and how actually EMFs do affect um, and could be part of the reason for autism. He actually, oh, sure. yeah. He has a few studies where they would they put those like anti EMF tents, like the third AK cage almost. Yeah. And it all calms down. All the symptoms, like the uh the mood swings, everything. Same with like he basically tells uh parents with autistic kids to turn the circuit breaker off to their room at night. Oh yeah. So there's nothing going and they're like, Wow, it's such a big difference. I'm like, Yeah, maybe it's uh eh. like there's shit I mean, going through. Really yeah, humans are really bad at like uh, understanding or believing things that we can't see 
which I understand because um, it, it took it took me, you know, learning the hard way and suffering from all this to be able to recognize what was going on too. Um, but that makes sense because uh, like the like a really healthy person who has no metabolic problems is not really that affected by Wi-Fi because their GABA system, like there's something that switches in your cells when GABA gets released that, and GABA is the um, true um, relaxation and sleep promoting mm -hmm. um, molecule in our body, not melatonin, which a lot of people have heard erroneously. Um, and um, if, for people that don't know, melatonin is like the backup adaptive sleep yeah. hormone and not the primary one. So GABA is the primary one. And when GABA kicks in, it switches out um, like copper and iron in cells for zinc. And zinc is a poor conductor of um, energy. Like, like it, it's more like it's why it's why like um, zinc can like store energy better because mm -hmm. it doesn't lose energy. So that same, but copper and iron are really efficient conductors of energy, and um, that's why the they have those roles in our physiology. That's why our body uses them in order to accomplish these things. So when you're really healthy and you have got great GABA function when you go to sleep or you know you're around wi-fi your your body is switching out that the copper and iron for zinc in those um, processes really easily and um so then the energy doesn't affect you but in anyone with metabolic problems aging um in general but you know more especially cancer and then like you know autistic people have very severely compromised um, metabolic uh, function totally. and so they have no resistance to those forces so that's what's really sad about Wi-Fi too is that healthy people don't really notice and they can go about their lives. It's the people who are really suffering who are most affected by it, um, which makes its urgency, you know, to be dealt with as an issue even more um, important. But um, yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, the worst part though is like the FCC literally has laws that go, you can never, never, it's like in the clause, blame one of the, uh, like Verizon or anyone who puts up a cell tower, you can never blame them for health problems. You can also yeah. never say that they can't put one somewhere. That's really shitty. They need, it's, you know, we want to have technology and we want to be able to have, you know, convenience and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. It's just that we need to find good, safe ways to do that. that yeah. Shut up. switches. Know, wired connections are faster anyway. Like I, yeah. I try to wire all of my stuff anyway. And, um, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Like uploading a video wired versus wireless, it's like instant. Yeah. 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 Or like, that's like the whole thing is if we had either phones that were smart, actually smart, that could turn on and off signal. So it'd be airplane mode every yeah. time. Yeah. Except going all, all 24 hours, a, 24 hours a day, only when it's needed. Exactly. And like they did, I, I was got stuck down a conspiracy rabbit hole on YouTube the other day, but <laughs> one of the things was like, it was, they took the SIM card out of the phone they put it on airplane mode. Then they took the SIM card out of another. So brand new phones and the guy just walked around different areas would stop. And then they looked at the back end to see what it was uploading to Google, which is everything. Like it knew everything regardless of if it had signal or not. Yeah. And the reason I'm saying that is because like if they were smartphones, they could turn off and cut all signal, but still just store all the data and then upload right when you go to actually use something. Yeah. It's That's like, more efficient for battery life anyway, which is always a problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's better for everyone. I have to plug it in every 30 minutes in order to keep it alive. I know I buy like my laptops alienware. So it's like, I'm completely against the norm with the max, but, uh, this is kind of off topic, but did you see, um, there's, uh, there was this like show on like, I think it was maybe on Netflix or something. It's really obscure. It's like some um, science channel show. Uh, some guy has invented a solid state battery um, that it also holds more um, information, but like, you know, you know, demonstrations when you puncture a battery and it explodes yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, his is solid state. And so it like, they were, they were poking holes through it and like, it was still like the iPad was still like on and really? <laughs> or anything um it's stuff like that like we need better smarter technology not because like you know they people who are people in business you know they want to make money obviously they're mm -hmm. not going to like side with people who are telling them to shut down their work but um i don't think there's anything wrong with you know making money and doing business but um oftentimes the ways that are better for us are also 
better for technology. Like they, they, they're more efficient. They're like faster. They cost less to produce, you know, that kind of like tends to be the case. I mean, um, like I talk about it in my book, like organic food, like makes farmers way more money than conventional (laughs) agriculture. Why are we pushing conventional agriculture? Like companies can make more money on better stuff because people are willing to pay for better quality anyway. So it doesn't really make sense to be pushing all of these. Well, crap. it's like when you go to the airport and you see like that Delta is using like a 1998 uh, windows and you're like, what did <laughs> you guys don't want to upgrade yet? It's like what, every 30 years or something. Yeah. I bet you it causes so many problems having that, that they could just fix by upgrading. Yeah. They're like, I'm sorry, you're not on here. Oh, it just froze. We have one of those load bars going again. Uh, we're going to have to call the IT guy. It's like a 90-year-old man who like was one of the first computer technicians still. <laughs> like, what is going on? Yeah, no, it's... I mean, Defender Shield is one of the coolest companies that I've seen when it comes to blocking all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I was like... I don't know them. Uh, they're uh, just an internet company, but they're really good for blocking EMFs. Like, they have phone cases, laptop cases, oh. a blanket for, like, pregnant women and stuff. Yeah. Um, they're a company that I definitely they, want to help promote. I bought I bought some material a while ago to test that out to see if like um and they were like kind of like sheets they were like mm-hmm. um but they did not improve my sleep at all right. and the problem was you know like the concept of a Faraday cage yeah it has to be completely enclosed and connected in order to work and with sheets or blankets and those kinds of things usually you know it's flat and there's no it doesn't you could maybe wrap yourself up in a cocoon I tried that. <laughs> putting over my hands up yeah. it didn't really work um but the other thing too i realized is that like a lot of those people they advertise that the more conductive a material is that the better it is at blocking the emf but it's exactly the opposite yeah the cheaper, less conductive materials are actually better at blocking and the one i got was like it had like silver or something woven mm-hmm. into like the threads and that's like the worst one because the the emf signals just kind of run off like water rather than like you want it more like putty where the energy hits it and then kind of just like gets stuck. And yeah. then that, that would help a lot better. And that's why like concrete and iron buildings block um, yep. cell signals so easily because um, they're not very conductive. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's what he was saying. He was like, Hey, if you buy one of those phone cases and you don't do your research on it first, he's like, normally it'll amplify it because now your phone's like, shit, I can't get a signal and it's trying yeah. harder to pull it in. It's like, but yeah, no, he was also, if you're using like one of the EMF or one of the uh, like grounding mats, they have those bed grounding mats, the bio mats. Uh, yeah. He's like, you got to measure it and also make sure your mattress is not a spring mattress because if it is, it's holding the charge and then it's oh, shooting yeah. back up into it. And then it's, you're just created like your own reverse. Well, I guess it's still very gauge, except you have it just on the inside of where you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, you know what? Okay. That makes sense. Cause that's, I have a spring mattress and that um if i had those sheets yeah i would have been it would have been maybe trapping the energy rather than actually blocking yeah. it i measured my parents i like went up and i was like yeah you guys are getting a new mattress right now <laughs> oh maybe i should invest in one of those um i i'm sort of blocking it because i can't move yet mm-hmm. um and i've moved so many times i hate it um but i'm thinking of just maybe giving up on Los Angeles altogether because it's got to the point where, okay, so like my neighbor next door is like a really great example of this. She's really terrible health. She's like, she had like two teeth removed and had pneumonia all this winter and really overweight and like, you know, just like angry and mean. And yeah, um, she is up. And I know this because she's always talking on the phone at these hours really, really loudly. She's up till like 3 a.m. and then she'll wake up at 5 or 6 a.m. and start phone calls again. And she'll and we've had it out a couple of times because she won't like stop. She does it right outside my wall. But um, she's awake because of Wi-Fi. Like she's if she wasn't if she was like living in the country away from all of this uh, radiological signals, she could yeah. be that ill and still sleep. But because she's not and she's living in Los Angeles and there's Wi-Fi radiation everywhere, like I seriously, I need, somebody needs to do a um, kind of a, a survey, a poll of yeah. insomnia in big cities. I bet you it will easily show that more than like 70 or 80 percent of all people in Los Angeles are suffering from insomnia. Oh, yeah. Uh, just because of this Wi-Fi. Everyone in the last apartment complex I lived in, 
they're always up at like two, three in the morning, every single night of the week. And everyone's just kind of thinks it's just them because everyone's kind of quiet, but, but the whole city has insomnia. It's really insane. Yeah. Um, I, I bet she, she's not yelling at me. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I bet you she mouth breathes too. So that's adding to it. So she's more yeah. stressed. And then, but what you were saying with the Wi-Fi and people uh, infecting insomnia, I mean, one of the easiest places to look is the animals and the bugs. And in cities, the bugs are leaving. Like, they're all dying off and they're getting out of cities because yeah. of the Wi-Fi and the noise and the uh, light pollution. Mm-hmm. Same with animals. Like, that's why you don't see them much. I mean, I remember um, when I lived in Salt Lake City, uh, they were, uh, mm-hmm. the city was planting a garden. Um, they, like, they made this new park and and we're trying to put in native species, which is really great. Yeah. Um, but they found that the pollution, the air pollution in the city was so severe that uh, a lot of the native grasses would actually die. They wouldn't grow in the lower, and Salt Lake City is in a valley, yeah. so all the pollution kind of sinks and sits in there. And because of that, it's like, it is, it often gets uh, the worst polluted city now in the United States. Um, really? Yeah, it's one of the reasons why I had to leave there because the winter time it gets really bad and um, slush. it was choking me. I got so sick every winter time when I was there. So um, um, it's sad because it's a really beautiful place, but um, and they also have this horrible copper mine that just like pollutes everything. But um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so these native grasses like wouldn't grow in the valley. They and and you think of plants as being fairly resilient, but like these grasses would actually die uh, because the pollution was so bad and. You can't help but think that that also has repercussions. Um, oh, you know, Utah yeah. has one of the highest teenage suicide rates in the whole country, too. Oh. And, like, you know, there, there are a lot of environmental factors that go into stuff like that. It's not just, like, the Mormon culture and religion there is really oppressive and, and, and uh, demoralizing. And, you know, and I tried to commit suicide when I was, um, I say my book, mm-hmm. when I was uh, 21. And um, there are more than just cultural aspects to that kind of thing. Cultural, yeah. cultural aspects have a huge part in it, but it can also be made um, immensely worse by environmental things like lack of sunlight and like increased pollution or, you know, even EMF signals that um, burden your body with extra um, uh, oh, yeah. excitation and stuff. So, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. Problems. <laughs> Yeah, with suicide, I mean, one of the things, uh, GABA, half GABA, ha- like having half the amount of GABA is horrible. And yeah. that oftentimes will, like, if they're already getting reduced sleep, and then you look at all the factors, you're like, hey, your GABA's cut in half too. So, of course, suicide then seems like it, it becomes more prevalent in people who have less GABA. I have to think that with the Mormon culture, there is that ability, like, if you're oppressive to a kid, like, the kid grows up literally with lower thresholds of GABA, and then eventually it catches up to them and then they're like, fuck, like nothing ever feels good. Yeah. Yeah. You get in the state. Cause like, um, like the um, melatonin opposes GABA and mm-hmm. melatonin also opposes dopamine and GABA promotes dopamine. And so, so you get, you get one dropping and you get the other up. You eventually get to a state where you have no dopamine. You have no good feeling <laughs> ever, but it's even more than that. It's like the, the, the chronic lack of, of, of good hormones and good nutrition and, and things that help to give your body energy mm-hmm. um, end up causing you to feel literal physical pain 24 yeah. hours a day all the time. And, you know, for, for, uh, for an organism to want to end their life rather than continue to suffer, that speaks volumes about what that kind of state is to live in. Um, but yeah, and so like, you know, GABA protects you from, um, from Wi-Fi and from other things like that. But yeah, and there's uh, a lot of other factors that go into it, obviously. Um, Oh yeah, that's why I try to touch the ground every day just for a yeah. minute. Just like I haven't done that as a practice. Um, I saw some uh, posts you had on Instagram or something with you mm-hmm. doing grounding, playing at a park. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's like right there. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, uh, I've done that. I haven't done grounding as like a practice. I think there's a lot of sense to it. There are bigger things like when I used to. I, I learned meditation when I was like 26 or something like that, and um, it was really, really helpful to a point. It wasn't strong enough to get me, yeah, like, overcome the metabolic problems that I was having, um, because 
uh, like for, I say this in the book too, forces of destruction are always more powerful than, than creation and healing. So if you don't get rid of the destructive forces, doing the good stuff isn't really going to make you, um, yeah. going to do you a lot of dramatic good. Um, it's depending on the amount and severity. Um, so I've been more focused on like the big things. I, yeah. I'll probably get into, like, Oh, it's fun. I just, I don't know. Yeah. If I'm like, if I'm like, uh, I'm going to do something anyways, like read a book or do a meditation and it's sunny out. I'm like, I'm just going outside. I'm going to go sit there. Well, I mean, that's why like, you know, let's take the stereotypical like hippie surfer person that lives like, you know, on a plantation in Hawaii. Yeah. I made lots of friends with when I lived there. Um, They're all beautiful. They're like fit and they're, they're not like going to the gym and like, they're, they're just like, you know, walking around every day barefoot and, you know, a lot and, you know, they're on the sun all day long and they're eating fruit and, you know, you're doing these things that are, very closely connected to how our bodies are meant to um, function in the natural world, you get those kind of benefits from that. Yeah. So when you're in an office building, you never touch dirt or grass <laughs> with your bare yeah. feet, you don't get sunlight exposure, your body is going to think that it's, we're in a perpetual winter time and it's going to yep. shut down and it's going to prevent you from keeping, from getting, um, from getting the healing that you need. I, this has also happened with a lot of the coaching I've done. I like, I start to realize what people are focused on and what messages aren't coming through. Mm -hmm. And so like my newest edition of the book, you know, went back to emphasizing light exposure. A lot of people just don't think of light as being important. And it is even more important than I thought it was for a long time. And so I really focus on trying to get people to get either get outside or get a really helpful light, you know, to use um, in your workplace and things like that, you know, try to do those things that um, get you, as much to a natural human environment as possible. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to dive into light now because I just got this thing called the Valky human charger. I love it. It's like, one of my favorite <laughs> what is it? Now. It's called, it's called, well, it's called the human charger. The brand is Valky, oh, okay. but it's, it looks like headphones. So it looks just like this uh, and it goes in and it's this bright white tuned. I forget what frequency incandescent light. It shines. It bounces off the ear canals Oh. It actually hits a few different uh, photoreceptor regions in the brain to yeah. wake it up. So, like in the morning, if I'm groggy, I'm like, in your ears. yeah, in the morning for for jet lag, it's like yeah. ridiculous because it like completely resets you to wherever you are. Mm-hmm. And then in the morning, like if you ever have like any of that tired under the eye feeling, I yeah. put it in, it's gone. It just gets oh, like you feel it leave. Yeah, um, that's really fascinating because. Um, uh, my chapter on depression, I talk about how the Rafe nucleus is like the the um, the serotonin um, center of the brain, and it responds to light stimulation, and not from your eyes. Like everyone, there's a lot of science that shows that, like you know, obviously the optical nerve stimulates the, um, the uh, pineal gland, uh, but the brain responds to light hitting all parts of the head, not just your eyes. Um, and there was a study that I found that they blindfolded the participants and uh, the areas of the brain still activated when light hit the sides and back of their head and specifically the rave nucleus. And um, that is the center where depression and those kinds of things Mm. develop. But the, um, you know, excess melatonin that comes from excess serotonin um, with the rave nucleus and the pineal gland um, contribute to things like that, like um, feeling lethargic, feeling overly tired, blocking restful sleep. Um, And when you lower those, your cellular energy suddenly shoots up. So like a lot of my therapies ask people to make sure that they get light exposure or to like sunlight exposure or to buy a safe um, artificial light in order to supplement that. Because without that, your our, the pineal gland is set to always release melatonin unless it gets light exposure. Hmm. So if you're not getting light exposure, your brain is always releasing melatonin and uh, you're going to end up developing metabolic disease. And then, you know, getting the light is the, as a solution to that yeah so that sounds like a really cool product because it might it might more uh efficiently get light into the brain yeah from now i'm gonna I'm i'll gonna... send you a link i've been dude i've been using it every day and i'm like this thing why how did i not know about this before because it's just like there are also there's this one called the vi light v-i-e light and that one is i think nose and ears so you're oh, yeah. like, you wake up, you put it in the yeah. <laughs> and then it's like charging you up. But yeah, no, the light, I mean, every morning now I make sure 
to get like about 20 minutes. So that's a 12 minute timer. And then uh, when I sit and do a meditation, I have the red light uh, either like shining at the back or shining in the front. I open every blind in the place. Yeah. And like, just give me as much light as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so I was doing more work on my GABA chapter because that, that's one of the ones that I haven't, like I say in the chapter that it's a fickle therapy because I don't know how to make it absolutely reliable every time like some of the other ones that are in there um and so i've been working on that for like the last year and i uh that led me to understanding what causes autism mm. um which is directly light related um the like in okay so in the winter time um we don't get sunlight right totally uh our vitamin d levels start to drop and vitamin D um, is what feeds good gut bacteria. We, um, uh, I mentioned in my book, we carry around uh, a, a, a microbiological farm with us. That's what the large yeah. intestine is, is, a farm that we have inside of our bodies that um, gut microbes use our food to generate nutrients for us. And in exchange for those nutrients, which are specifically the short chain fatty acids, mm -hmm. but there are like other things that they do, um, we give them vitamin D. So it's the vitamin D that helps promote, and there are other factors that, that influence this, yeah. which I talk about in my book, but the primary one is vitamin D. And so um, if you're not getting sunlight, you don't make vitamin D. And then what happens is, is the good bacteria in your gut start to die off and other ones come in. And the ones that come in are ones that promote fat retention, muscle wasting, and um, because they are more like, uh, uh, part of um, nutrient um, preservation yeah. uh, body and the body controls all of this mostly this isn't like um, this is not supposed to happen this is exactly yeah. what's supposed to happen when you don't get light exposure it's our body's way of surviving winter time when usually there weren't um, an abundance of nutrients so um, so this happens in everybody. Like if you don't get enough vitamin D, you get these, you, that's why everyone gains weight during the winter time. Yep. Um, your melatonin rises, vitamin D drops, and then the gut bacteria um, switch. Um, so getting it's light like, and vitamin, oh, what? It's like, it's like the lakes. It's that turnover effect. The lakes? Yeah, and lakes, there's like the hot water goes to the bottom and the cold oh. water goes to the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a cycle. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, in, and in the energy from the sun um, drives that both that and microbiological or bi uh -huh. microbiological activity um so uh wait where was it oh vitamin d um okay so you don't so your vitamin d drops and you get these gut bacteria um and then that's where and then but what happens is in our the way that we live we don't have a lot of natural sunlight exposure so um you don't recover from that winter time so and, and most depression and anxiety and weight problems and and thus you know and i don't talk about weight problems aesthetically i'm talking about like how it relates to our metabolic rate and our mm -hmm. overall health i don't care if you're fat like i was yeah. fat for a long time fat being fat is actually a protective mechanism against yeah. um these metabolic problems so um uh but what happens is if you don't if you're in an office job you're never outside you don't recover from that winter state your vitamin d levels stay suppressed and what happens then is that the condition gets worse. And then you, you never get back to that high energy state where your body, during the wintertime, your body is shut down. It's preserving nutrients. It's not exercise. It's not, it's not activating the um, regenerative processes that uh, robustly regenerate tissue and mm. heal your body. So you end up um, perpetuating that and sustaining that from year to year. And that's when you end up getting, you know, severe metabolic problems. You end up developing cancer, um, thyroid disease, um, real bad insomnia, um, you know? And so like, like my depression and insomnia and stuff, like I started when I was younger, I got some sunlight, but I was always in school. And like, I, even on, I, um, on the swimming team, we swam in a bubble. Mm -hmm. So we didn't even have, um, uh, I didn't even have a light exposure when I was like yeah, swimming. Um, uh, there were probably just like two or three months in the summertime that it was that it was off and um, you know during those times I'd feel good but um, because I was also over exercising and under eating that made those issues worse so even the little bit of sunlight I was getting wouldn't help yeah. so um, you know there are other factors but the, um, the vitamin D is such the is such a is the most important part so um, uh, sorry my brain is not yeah vitamin D 
gut turnover, uh, how it affects autism, storing well, fatty acids. Yeah, so so I, I discovered a lot of these things earlier, and there, there are things in my book. I talk about, like, mm. you know, avoiding protein strategically, not in general, as a way to, like, um, to suppress a bacteria that contribute to bloating and excess ammonia and stuff like that. So all of this was kind of, like, leading me in this direction for GABA where I um, – then realize like I started reading about um, well okay so biotin is really important when it comes to um, GABA and uh, those kind of proteins you can't biotin has this function where um, it breaks down macronutrients so that we can then use them um, or micronutrients um, we can use them to make other things mm. so if you don't have enough biotin that's like one of the top like foundational nutrients that we need. And so if you don't have that, there's a whole cascade of things that um, end up not working. And one of them is also making vitamin D. Um, you cannot make vitamin D if you don't have adequate intake of, of biotin. And as I was like doing all this research and all these like keywords, I ended up coming across some studies about autistic people and not, and they, they textbook don't have any of those things that I was looking for with GABA. They don't have biotin, they don't have vitamin D. Um, they have high ammonia. They have all of those things that are um, related to um, deficient GABA production. Um, and my mind was blown. I was just kind of like, this is so obvious. Like, why isn't anybody talking about this? And I um, started investigating why this biotin like deficiency could be there. And um, there's bacteria make this molecule called streptavidin and mm -hmm. it binds biotin and it prevents biotin absorption. And um, old, people that are Asian and metabolically ill also have a lot of those similar um, problems. And I've known for a long time that a lot of those are gut related and, 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 and caused by microbes that have pathogenic um, activity. They might not yeah. be outright pathogenic, but they have path pathogenic um, problems. Um, I feel like I'm talking a mile a minute here. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I love it. We go back to pregnant women, which I uh, discuss in my chapter on GABA as sort of like the representative of GABA problems. Because pregnancy is so stressful on the body, it causes these issues. And um, pregnant women also often develop biotin deficiencies. So I think it's, a, it's either a state where the body purposefully allows these microbes in, in order to increase fat storage and nutrient um, reservation rather than and lowering the metabolic rate in order to prevent excessive use due to lack of um, sunlight exposure or other nutrient deficiencies. Or it could also be that these bacteria take advantage of that state and then, and, but either way they end up having a detrimental effect long term. Yeah. Um, so these bacteria make this um, protein called streptavidin that binds biotin. And then I found out, too, that researchers for a long time, um, they've always been using streptavidin in, in research because it reacts with molecules and biotin, and it allows them to um, measure and identify various other molecules. Yeah. And it's really useful in research. Um, so scientists for like the last like few decades have been developing strains of these bacteria that produce streptavidin to make them produce you know better and more streptavidin. And even one uh, study talked about making a molecule, uh, uh, mutating a bacteria to create a molecule that was like streptavidin, but it was even ten times more powerfully binding to biotin. Yeah. So I think, you know, obviously it's speculative to say that this that those kind of bacteria are. Um, no problem, but yeah. it seems like it seems very unlikely that these bacteria have been contained in a lab and are not in the general populace. If you're gonna like bacteria is so hard to contain. Um, if you're a really, really high tech lab, you know, but they're like this is these bacteria are used all over the world oh, yeah. to have it in and it's really accessible. It makes sense that these microbes might already be in the population, even if they're not. Um, it's uh, the activity of that molecule is clearly apparent to me what is responsible for blocking biotin mm -hmm. which then causes metabolic problems in people in autistic people this happens when you are young because most people don't get these bacteria until they're older um, when our immune systems start to fail and by that time we're already developed our brain is fine well, fully grown our bodies are fully grown there's no development for them to get in the way of they just get in and then get in the way of maintenance 
Mm -hmm. So then you end up developing problems like brain fog and um, lethargy and malaise and depression. And, you know, you can eventually get cancer and that's really bad from yeah. a lot of like that. But with autistic people, I mean, cause children are really resilient. Like they have really robust immune systems. I mean, they get sick, like colds and stuff a lot, but like, yeah. but they largely resist anything. They don't get HPV. You know, they don't get like other diseases um, that older people get really easily. Their, their guts stay relatively um, homeostatic for a long time. Um, so with autistic people, what happens is when that bacteria is somehow allowed to get into the gut at a young age, and then the catastrophic loss of that biotin then completely inhibits um, brain development. Mm. Not completely, but mostly inhibits brain development. And then um, the also resultant increase in ammonia and other byproducts of that then stop um, or slow current cognitive ability. And then on top of that also causes all the agitation, you know, and other things like autistic, you know, kids suffer a lot from emotional stress. Yeah. And it's because of these hormones and things that are, are, are going on in their body causes them immense suffering. And, um, uh, you know, for a long time, people have known that if you change diets, that it improves. There's all these things that improve yeah. autism, and they all point to the activity of this protein blocking biotin absorption. But then, of course, it has. Um, oh, sorry. Then we were talking about sunlight because. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I just haven't stopped talking. Yeah. We were talking about sunlight, and because so because also because you don't have biotin, you can't make the precursors for vitamin D. So then you don't make vitamin D when you're in the sun. So mm -hmm. your gut microbiome never switches over. So oh. I've developed this idea, yeah. So I've developed this idea based on my other protein strategy fastings to just go without protein for a time, and that will completely stop these bacteria from being able to produce streptavidin, and then you can absorb the biotin, and then, um, but you do it, you do it, and if you have if you have autism or your uh, your child has autism. Um, you can help them do this, um, but this also has um, implications for everybody else that has metabolic disease as well. Yeah, metabolic problems um, because we are get we get these bacteria too. Um, so you go without eating any protein for like maybe I'm not, I'm developing this still as we speak, so I'm not yeah. totally sure about all of it. But I've already started. I had two days in the sun. It feels great. Um, you go without protein so that the bacteria cannot produce streptavidin. Then you can absorb all the B vitamins, make vitamin D precursors, get out in the sun. Mm. If you're not getting out in the sun, going without protein really isn't going to help you that much. It will get rid of some ammonia and help yeah. you like symptomatic, but it won't permanently um, switch over your gut microbiome until you're able to get out in the sun and make vitamin D. So, um, and then, so then you make the vitamin D, start feeding healthy bacteria, then your mm -hmm. gut microbiome switches over and that should, um, in theory, uh, alleviate autism symptoms for those that are suffering from it. Um, yeah. wow. And families that have it too, you could also like, pace in the process with the help of like antibiotics or like iodine something to wipe out the gut mm -hmm. bacteria while uh, at the first while you're doing the protein fast but but don't do it afterward because you want the good bacteria to grow um uh while you're making the vitamin d and it, and it should help you well um and one other thing on that too like somebody just mentioned um uh, to a, a post on my article that uh mm -hmm. the autistic people have bad breath and I was like, that sounds like really like a stereotype. Like, why would you say something <laughs> like that? And then I looked it up and it turns out that, yeah, autistic people suffer actually like one of the symptoms they have a real problem with is, is yeah. halitosis. Yeah. And that, is, that is directly related to protein fermenting bacteria that make those noxious odors. Oh, and man. people who have a healthy gut microbiome don't suffer from that. So it seems really obvious to me that that's the cause, but obviously, yeah. And then my book, um, uh, has those elements in there and then the forthcoming update will include all of this stuff as well. Yeah. yeah I mean, wow. And so like, then you add something like EMFs to that and it's like GABA is worse. Sunlight likely isn't being absorbed the same way too. And everything functions in a worse position. So yeah. you're setting Unable to resist the stress that's being caused by those stressors, especially like for a pregnant woman who's working. Like if she's working, and pregnant and inside never seen sunlight and then the reduction of everything just goes on to that baby yeah i actually because uh, i was working with a pregnant woman recently um uh pregnancy sickness is directly related to how well your metabolic rate can withstand stress like if you if you're metabolically ill you will be more you will get more sick when you get pregnant because you're really? 
progest yeah, progesterone is um, the surge in progesterone. What it's doing is it's really it's forcing all the cells in the body to clean house. Um, and so the more metabolically ill you are, the less your body has been able to maintain cellular health. So the surge in progesterone is causing just a really severe remodel of your tissues and dumping out all of that crap um, makes you really ill. So if you sustain your, if you're able to sustain your metabolic rate and keep your cells healthy, you don't get as sick as bad. And obviously I'm, I've not been pregnant, but yeah. <laughs> people that I'm helping. So, and there's just the stuff that I know. I mean, I have used preg, um, progesterone though obviously yeah. and um i do know what that does emotionally <laughs> i i yeah. very times felt like a pregnant woman <laughs> <laughs> i love progesterone though it's one of the yeah, I do too. i've been taking it with some androsterone so i kind of like pair them together often um i like it i mean i sleep so well but i have to get more sleep if i take it i'm like if i wake up and i'm like i have to get up at this time and like go like crazy hard the next morning it's like that's not gonna happen it's like relax not gonna happen if you take progesterone yeah 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 it makes you yeah should we talk about that a little bit actually that's a little oh, yeah. bit topical so um because i've had people say that i've been helping and i, I and they, they're like i'm so sleepy every morning now i can't wake up blah 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 and um i have to explain that that is not actually always a bad thing mm -hmm. um, there's a big difference between having not having restful sleep and feeling sleepy in the morning um, when you actually like do sleep well, you will feel sleepy in the morning. Oh, really? Yeah. Feeling, um, okay. I can illustrate this really easily by when I took resveratrol when I was like 20 yeah. and I, um, and I, and I had, I just gone through a horrible heartbreak too, actually right in a row. And I was so miserable and I started smoking a lot of pot to try to, um, deal with the anxiety and stuff mm -hmm. that I was having. But I also started taking resveratrol and it was cause like it was the first time that I'd like really gained any weight and I was um, desperate to try to like get thin. Yeah. And, um, right away when I started taking resveratrol, it just made me like get up at five in the morning and I like wanted to do nothing but put on my shoes and go for a run. And I would run for like 45 minutes hard. And I did this for like a month straight every single morning. Really? But I started to feel so agitated that I needed to just start smoking more pot. And I like, I literally like was such a lightweight, like yeah. <laughs> the tiniest little like leaf would get me so fucking stoned. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and it, it helped for a little bit, but not really. It was, you know, it was more of a band aid, and um, uh, I lost a lot of weight really fast, but I also lost muscle tone. And in my book, I talk about how it affected my heart. Like my heart started, yeah. I started having, um, palpitations it would um skip a beat and then beat faster and it was really yeah. scary first time that happened i was actually in the swimming pool uh during a workout with my team and um it happened while i was stroking and so i panicked i thought i was having a heart attack i had to stand up in the middle of the pool to avoid drowning because i couldn't breathe as well it was really really wow. scary um resveratrol increases your cortisol like dramatically so mm -hmm. that's way that it affects your health and it's a really really bad thing if you're younger and you haven't undergone a stressful event resveratrol might make you lose some fat but everybody else it will absolutely destroy your health yeah um and uh oh wait what was i talking about now i forgot it. you were talking about how resveratrol was one of uh would get you up every morning at oh five yeah waking up in the morning okay so i thought that this feeling of waking up at 5 a.m. and wanting to conquer the world was like a great thing. I'd been raised in this moralistic community that was really shaming of lazy people. Mm. And, you know, you, you, you only get, yeah, you only, the earlier bird gets the worm. You only get what, you know, life will give you if you work really hard for it. Um, so I took this waking up as like a really good sign, but then I started having these health problems from it. Mm. And then, you know, through all of my, like, you know, the terrible crash of my health and cancer and like, you know, my life falling apart. Um, and uh, well, and obviously all the science that I know now, I um, have come to understand that um, when you wake up early in the morning and you feel raring to go, it's because you have really high stress hormones. And those stress hormones purpose is to motivate us to go out and hunt and gather and get food. Yeah. So um, that's why I have my bow and arrow, I have my bow and arrow directly next to my bed. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it's fun target practice right in the morning. Go out in your backyard and shoot a squirrel. Yeah, um, or a person. It depends who's louder. <laughs> um, 
So uh, when you when you're the opposite of that, when you are well fed and your metabolic rate is fine, you want you feel like sleeping in. You, you have high GABA still. You're low melatonin, low stress hormones. You have that wake up waking up feeling where you feel warm and cozy in bed. You feel you you're not panicked or stressed. Mm -hmm. You don't feel like you've got to get up and do stuff. But yet you are rested. You feel rested throughout the rest of the day anyway you don't because when you have those high stress hormones what happens is you go out and you hunt and gather food you have a crash later you start to like want to sleep once you get to work yep. and you got to use lots of coffee to get to get back awake so um yeah so that 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 it's actually a really good sign when you start repairing your metabolism that you feel sleepy in the morning and in the mid-afternoon because those are our natural circadian rhythms mm -hmm. where our body wants to be sleeping because it's restorative and healthful. Um, and if you don't have those, it's usually a sign that you have really high adrenaline or cortisol still, and um, which is fine. Those hormones are they're, they're for a purpose. They're yeah. supposed to help bridge the gap that your body cannot accomplish without them. So, But when you're feeding yourself constantly and you're increasing your metabolic rate and temperature, you actually will feel sleepier more often. If you're not sleeping well and you feel tired, which is different than sleepy, um, that's usually because you're not getting restful sleep, which is due to low GABA and low um, glutathione, things like our, our antioxidants like glutathione totally. products. And you can actually take a, um, a selenium supplement that helps you make mm. glutathione, um, glutathione peroxidase. So you can take that to help with your sleep, in addition to everything else that I talk about in my book. Um, yeah. Yep, yeah. More no, it's, I mean, the difference between being tired and being sleepy is tired. Like I literally I'll go to the gym and like, I can't do what I think I can do when I'm sleepy. It's like, okay, whatever. And then I jump out of it. Yeah. But no, I a hundred percent agree with that. I think a lot of times, uh, um, people like the different brain waves, the different states that you're in, like alpha is like, go, go, go. Beta is like, you're pretty tuned. Like you can breathe, you can do whatever and learn pretty well. But when you're getting into like Delta or Theta, you're going to be a bit more relaxed. And a lot of times like uh, Joe Dispenza talks about in his book, when you're first getting into these longer meditations, which is like an hour long, he's like, you're probably going to notice your head like it keeps falling because you're like so relaxed and like getting into that state that you're falling asleep or you're so sleepy that like your body starts to do it, but it knows that you're like tuned into whatever you're doing. Over time, it gets used to what is the sleepy relaxation type brainwave so that then you can like you know do the meditation but at the beginning most people like he's like but no one better be on and i'm gonna come stick my finger in your mouth <laughs> but it's uh no it's one of those cool things i mean i wake up tired often but i used to right now i'm not i used to only wake up naturally no alarm nothing like that and then I noticed that no matter what, when the sun was out and I woke up, I would be able to get into anything. Like I would never be like, oh, I just need to lay here in the bed. I'd always be like, okay, let's go do something. Even if I'm, if I'm tired. Yeah. Well, that's where your um, that light device you're talking about yep. for the, ear, like that light does that light is actually a natural stimulant for the active part of our metabolism. And that's why I always like to get an apartment that has South or, or east yep. facing windows in the bedroom so that the light will wake me up naturally because otherwise i feel yeah lethargic without it how about people with no windows they're just like in a cocoon they're like what yeah, what day is it the lady next door has her curtains pulled all the time and i tried to explain i tried to be friends with her when she yeah. was and, and i tried to help her with her health and um i tried to explain to her how she has to have more light exposure she's she just shuts the windows all day long and she's just in that dark place all day it's sad I was there when I was depressed. I would always yeah. close the windows and crawl into bed, but, um, but it's, you won't get better that way. No. Um, yeah. Well, you're talking about when you, um, when you, when you're tired and you like don't have energy to exercise, don't yeah. exercise. Yeah. It's a really good, um, people, you, the biggest, one of the biggest lessons I learned from my experience was having compassion for my physical body rather than resenting it because <laughs> yeah. if you resent it, you'll end up losing it a lot faster. Um, when you don't have energy, don't do that stuff. It, it's a sign that your body is not able to accomplish it well. And if you take a bunch of pre-workout, it'll overload your stress hormones and it'll degrade your, not only your bulk, your muscle bulk, but it will um, degrade your heart and your brain, and your kidneys and yeah. uh, 
prevent them from healing. So yeah, go home and I mean, you can have a coffee, have a coffee, yeah. and work out, <laughs> have a yeah. coffee, and some sugar and ha- enjoy your afternoon and work out when you have energy. Yeah. That's, I mean, one of the biggest things I'm always like, is if people are so detached from their body, like who they are. They're like walking around, they're like my feet hurt, my knees hurt, whatever. I'm going to keep going. I'm like, that doesn't is, make any sense. That is a protective mechanism. Uh, the sicker you get, your mind actively detaches from your body mm-hmm. in order to dull the pain that you're feeling. Um, and when I started getting better, I did not, I hurt when I had cancer and I did not realize how painful it really was until I got better. Yeah. Uh, and like people like, you know, my mom has a lot of health problems and, um, and she's disconnected from her body. It's, it's a protective mechanism, but you've got to get, the problem is, is you've got to listen to your body and get in touch with it in order to make the improvements and part of the reason yeah. i was able to do all of this was because my body was in such an ill state that any little changes were really noticeable totally and so I, could, I could i could see if even just taking a supplement once in the afternoon it would have effects that i could notice right away and by paying attention to my body i was able to do that totally yeah i mean when when i would go into longer like ashtanga yoga is like 90 minute sessions mm-hmm. that's when i'm like at like minute 65 you know everything that's going on in your body you're like you can just like tell what is good it's so weird because then like and i'm not saying like everyone needs to do 90 minute yoga but like even doing like 20 minute yoga like daily or like some type of like internal like less of the like external like aesthetic type exercise and yeah. more of the internal like what is going on inside of me or like hatha yoga is perfect it's like 10 to 15 minutes every morning yeah. that I was like, you, I could just tell what was going on with me always. I was like, okay. Or like foam rolling. One thing I've been doing a lot, Paul Check talks about when you're rolling out your gut is to flex and you'll actually, so then the muscles pulled. And when you're rolling out that part, see if when you're flexing, it's sore or when you relax, if it's sore. And if it's sore when you relax, that's the gut area or whatever organ you're over. Or if you're flexed, you're hitting the muscle. So it's really interesting because then, oh, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. then you eat yeah, something. Like- yeah, there are poses in yoga where, you know, you do that same concept like um, turning and squeezing. And I had this really great teacher in Santa Monica that would, she focused mostly on breath work and that kind of stuff. And she would do that same thing. She'd be like uh, talking about how those different sensations are the either the organ or the muscle. Yeah, it's it's crazy because I'll notice I'll eat something, then I'll roll out my gut and it's painful. And I'm like, God damn it. I eat that thing. That's the inflammation from the things you're eating that you're not supposed to. Although I imagine you do a good job at eating what you're supposed to. Yeah, I just you know I have my childhood predispositions always want me to eat candy. Yeah, candy can be fine as long as it's not. Um, I know. You know. A lot of people, even people that are in our circles, still kind of don't do sugar. But yeah. literally, I lost sixty pounds eating four pounds of sugar a week. Yeah, that was just in my protein shakes. Uh, in addition to all of the candy and fruit and other calories I was eating and it was that that sugar and it, be, it wasn't pure white refined sugar yeah. it, was yeah. un, it was unrefined sugar from whole foods but um but it's still sugar and it's really it, it's like it's medicinal the fructose actually stimulates your metabolic rate oh. more than anything else and um but uh yeah. uh oh wait foam rolling meditation oh yeah because I I think I um I, I did meditation and yoga for a long time too. I think I'm probably better at listening to my body because I did all of that in my past. That yeah. probably has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a friend who I had on the podcast a little while ago. He's near you um, in LA and he does resistance flexibility. Um, and it's very interesting. Cause like he, this one he posted on Instagram and I do like every day now it's a heart stretch and you can feel as you're like, creating the resistance with one arm um pull like pushing and pulling with one arm and kind of like getting the pressure there you can feel a stretch in the organ but oh, he, he's right near yeah so that's super interesting because then you're like oh this is what the liver feels like yeah. when it's getting all the resistance on it yeah um this is funny as i've been as my health has improved and i've been losing weight and my a lot of weight that people have is um is actually around their intestines. It's all the water mm-hmm. from the inflammation and the bloating. As that goes away, I'm now able to like feel my lower internal organs. <laughs> like when I flex and like I can squeeze stuff again. And I couldn't do that for a long time because I was so ill. Um, and it feels really nice. Like it feels like things are, yeah. Like, like I'm in touch with them again. They're not like they felt oh, yeah. wild. <laughs> 
Yeah, there was a study I looked at a while back, and I tried to find it again. I couldn't find it because I don't remember the name of it. But it was about um, the conscious awareness and ability to uh, do like joint rotations and like essentially what this study was summing up was the more control you have over different areas in your body, the less likely cancer is to ever take that area. Like to oh, be that has a lot. Yeah, that has a lot to do with like what Ray P would talk about with um, cancer's connection to the um, parasympathetic nervous system. Mm. When you, um, most cells all the time operate autonomously. They have their function and they sit and they do it. Mm-hmm. They don't need input from the rest of the body. They don't need like, they respond to hormones and stuff, but they don't need like stimulation. They just kind of do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. As you get older and you get, or you get metabolic diseases, um, they lose the ability to do that on their own. And then the body comes in and tries to force them. So like, and this actually has a lot of implications with like hair loss. Yeah. And I, I talk about in my chapter on hair restoration, um, the, as, as you age, your body tries to stimulate cells by, um, increasing signals to them like so the parasympathetic nervous system sends out stimulus to those areas of the body that are um metabolically weakening in order to spur them on and yeah so that's why and that and ray p talks about that's why it can't a lot of one of the bigger causes of cancer is the parasympathetic nervous system overly stimulating areas of the body constantly because of the metabolic insufficiency of that area and so yeah yeah. So it's like just adding fire to the to the flame. Yes, exactly. Uh, so that's why therapies, um, a lot of the things that I talk about in my chapter on cancer, but also, you know, um, sunlight and and, and, mm-hmm. and and providing adequate nutrition, um, those things help to uh, repair those cells so they can, again, function on their own. And then the parasympathetic nervous system quiets and doesn't activate, overactivate anymore. Totally. Um, and that, that has implications. Like if you ever, um, most men, male pattern baldness, um, the pattern of balding also follows the nervous system um, structure from like, because the ner- nerves don't really come out of our skull. They come out of our yeah. eye and like, you know, the holes in our skull and they, and then they run this way. And so that's one of the, and the same thing is in the back where they come up into the top here. The, the baldness progression happens along the nervous path where the um, impulses are wow. like, you know, they're hitting the lower part first and over the years as, it, as it's chronic and it, it progresses, it's along the route of the nervous system. So you can see those kind of correlations when you know what the underlying yeah. is. I mean, That's interesting. That's like where people gain fat and you can tell what it's linked, which hormone is uh, linked to based on like the areas. Ah, I love that stuff because people, are, everyone's like, I don't get it. I gained fat here. And then it's like, well, let's see what you're doing. Yeah. That, that has a lot. Um, everyone that I have ever coached, um, I, I have to grill into them the importance of doing the temperature and pulse diagnostic. Yeah. If you have my book. It's in the, the chapter on how to perform self therapy. It is the most important tool that you have because the pattern of temperature and pulse shows those things too. It shows you exactly which hormones are elevated and which ones are the problem. Um, if you, uh, like say for instance, you measure your temperature in the morning, temperature and pulse in the morning, and you have a high pulse, um, but a low temperature. That means you have really high adrenaline because adrenaline stimulates your pulse rate. Let's say you have really low temperature, I mean pulse rate and a high temperature. That means high cortisol because cortisol helps mm. to maintain the um, body temperature, but it doesn't stimulate your heart rate. If you have both elevated in the morning, but then you eat breakfast and they fall, that means that you have both high cortisol and high adrenaline because they're sustain- both sustaining the metabolic rate. Yeah. And that's actually healthier than if you don't have, if you only have one. Yeah. Because if, if you have only one, it means one, the other one probably isn't working or you've run out of the ability to make it. Um, so yeah, so you can tell those things by that diagnostic and they have a direct influence on the outcome of those diagnostics, but also the effect they have on your body and whether or not you're able to actually get better and, and improve. So yeah, so I always like, that's the thing like people, cause I, they're constantly emailing me, oh, I've been trying this and I've been trying that. I said, I didn't tell you to try those things. Yeah. <laughs> Monitor your pulse and temperature. Like that is the only diagnostic where you can reliably um, evaluate the state of your health. You're just doing it by looking in the mirror, yeah. measuring your waist, 
or how and you're just taking stuff and hoping things get better won't happen the you mirror have yeah, but, yeah the mirror and the scale are literally the worst places to look for how your health is doing yep, yep. they're like they have no indication of anything that is going on within you like what okay so one thing i was helping someone who's older a woman um drinking lots and lots of diet soda and having um angina do you know what angina is um dryness uh or no, no. sorry uh, angina is um a condition where your um your vascular system contracts so violently that it hurts it oh. feels like a heart attack most really? people when they, yeah when, most people when they start having this they think they're having a heart attack which by the way heart attacks don't always actually hurt you just like start to get really really super tired apparently mm. like if you if you're in that realm of health you should like look up rosie o'donnell's like experience and yeah it was about her talking about it you can have a heart attack for like three days without even feeling like you have to go to the hospital three days yeah she had a she was having a heart attack for like three days before she realized it was a heart attack and she finally went to the hospital that would be because we have all, all the film and tv tell us you're supposed to clutch your chest and collapse on the floor yeah. And it, <laughs> angina happens that way angina feels like you're having a heart attack so that happens uh, so the cardiovascular system is contracting really badly um that is happening because you've gotten to a point where you've lost so much water from your blood volume that there's not enough blood volume to fill your cardiovascular system when we when we lose water from our cardiovascular system it contracts in order to maintain blood pressure and um uh, anyway, so angina happens when you do that. But um, the thing is, is that uh, uh, it affects your weight. If you like, so a lot of people use diuretics, especially like the generations older than us. Yeah. Diuretics were marketed to them like crazy for pregnant women. And they're really, really dangerous too. And um, diuretics, the problem is, is that um, you can weigh less by losing huge amounts of water from your blood volume. Totally. And it's really unhealthy because you need if you don't have adequate blood volume your um, cardiovascular system then has to contract constantly in order to maintain blood pressure mm. and that stresses out your cardiovascular system to no end and that is the main cause of, of like heart attacks and those kinds of episodes is because you don't have enough blood volume to maintain totally uh, blood pressure without that chronic and that chronic action makes them fatigue and then they give out and, and ruin. so so yeah so weight loss can be um like on a scale or by visual appearance, it doesn't really mean a lot. Like it, it's, 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 you can weigh like me, like my size, I'm six foot seven and like 260 pounds. You're six, seven. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. And uh, for me, that amount of blood volume required to be healthy probably is a good 10 pounds of water. Yeah. Like if I, so I could lose 10 pounds and that happened when I went on that low protein diet that I talk about in my book. Mm -hmm. I mean, high protein diet, low carb diet that low, like low carb will make you lose water. Um, yeah. Really and fast. But it's, what? And then you think you're shredded. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you're losing mostly water from your cardiovascular system, which can have really, really harmful effects, um, for the rest of your body. So yeah. So weight is not a, yeah, not a good way to do it. So, Temperature and pulse are the way to monitor your metabolic health. Yeah, and one of the things, because I talk to so many people about this, and they're like, yeah, I drink so much water, which one is like, okay, cool. But uh, like people yeah. nowadays love to be like, I drink more water than you. It's like, okay. It's I, I passed this girl at this old job that I had, and she had a gallon milk jug of water with a straw in it. And I... I <laughs> I am really bad. I was an older brother. I love telling people what to do. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I, so I have to work really hard not to do that, but I couldn't resist in that moment. I had to be like, this is so dangerous what you're doing to yourself. Actually, like this will actually cause you health problems. And I explained to her yeah. the whole process. And like, so the problem with like the person I was working with, the older person that was drinking lots of diet Coke, um, you don't have any carbs cause it's diet. Yeah. You're taking lots of caffeine, which is not bad, but it can be bad in yes. the wrong, wrong situations. Um, uh, that diuretic is causing you to lose not only the water, but also all the electrolytes and minerals yeah. that manage water. But then you're still consuming all of this liquid. So you no longer have the minerals that manage that liquid. 
that liquid is then leaving your um, cardiovascular system and it floods into your tissues, causes edema and causes bloating and swelling, which also lowers your metabolic rate and contributes to metabolic um, issues like cancer and stuff like that. So um, mm. yeah, yeah. No, the whole drinking water thing. Like if you, conversely also, yeah, I promote the use of sodium acetate for a lot of yep. stuff. An increase in sodium will raise your blood volume and in that case, you do need to drink water in order to supply the water that's stimulated otherwise. But it's all by thirst. If you're thirsty, if you have a dry mouth, drink some water. If you don't, don't force it. There's no <laughs> yeah. force either way. Like you don't, don't abstain. Oh, and this, because this is also a problem in a lot of the forums I used to see where people thought, because Ray P would talk about how water inside and outside the cell affected a cell's metabolism. Yeah. And a lot of people extrapolated from that that you should like starve yourself of water, like just avoid water all the time. That's uh, Matt, Matt Stone. He's like going to wa- like stop water for a bit. Oh, does he adver- does he advocate that? He had one one thing, and I tried it because I try everything because I just want to yeah, see yeah, me too. what happens. <laughs> uh, and it was like see what the like minimal amount of water you could go through the day with. So it was like I would have like a cup in the morning, and then like my coffee, and like mm-hmm. some tea, and then yeah. some orange juice. No. So like four cups, three and a half cups. And I was like, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It can be really, um, it can be really harmful for your health if you avoid water too. So just go by your thirst. That is the only thing you have to pay attention to with water. Oh yeah. Then, then we did the opposite. We carried around a bag of salt. So we would just see if we could just eat the, I think the upper threshold is like 30 grams of salt, which is like the 10 grams of sodium. That was fun too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was hard. Yeah. You, people are always like, "Oh yeah, I eat too much salt," which is like completely logical, and that's not a real thing because most people don't get enough salt. Yeah, but thirty grams of salt is so much salt. Like you don't <laughs> understand until you're like at is a restaurant. A, like, did you feel really nauseous? Did it make you really nauseous? Not really. The thing is, like, I would even like do a shot of salt, like at some points in time, and then you have to run to the bathroom if I did too much. So I had to like learn, like, yeah, 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 don't yeah, do yeah. two grams of salt. Like that's gonna be a lot of salt with <laughs> just a shot of water. And like, it was just one of those things where. But now I I make sure to put I put salt in all my water, um, a good yeah. like, a couple pinches, and then I'm like, okay, that's that's enough. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, actually, you just hit on it. That um, sodium is one of the things that regulates gut function. So, if you have enough sodium in your body, your mm. when you don't have enough sodium in your body, your intestinal system will absorb too much water, and that can also be stimulated by endotoxin and excess yeah. bacterial activity too. And then that those cells swell, and the water content um, reduces their electrical conductivity. Then they cannot contract, and that's what causes constipation. You end up having um, your, 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 inte- your, your intestinal system can't do peristalsis and move the food along. It just sits there. Um, mm. So uh, taking in high electrolytes, usually, most importantly salt, will, and that sodium then causes those cells to flush out the water. So the electrical conductivity actually works again, and then suddenly you have to evacuate. So um, yeah, that happened. Then that's one of the benefits of why, like I advertise, um, the use of sodium acetate oh, yeah. um, because that doesn't just happen in your intestinal system. That's what happens all over your body, in your heart, in your kidneys, in your brain. Um, your sodium to water content, plus you know calcium and um, potassium and stuff like that, obviously, but um, determines how well your cells run or not. And um, sodium chloride table salt can be a problem though because of the excess chloride. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think the reason that sodium, like salt intake, has uh, often been vilified is actually because of excess chloride and not mm. excess sodium. And I, I do go at length explaining this in my book, but um, in the in the updated version, if you don't have that, um, and uh, uh, is because chloride is um, really activating. It's like it's like it, it helps run our physiology fast. And if you take too much of it, you often you get too much stimulation. Mm. Um, and so I think it's the chloride that's the problem in excess sodium intake. But just sodium, sodium is like not a problem and your body can get rid of it really easily, excess. And um, so using something like sodium acetate tends to be uh, really helpful for that kind of stuff because you're not getting excess chloride while you take it as well. Totally. Well, it's not totally related, but I did a float tank the other day. A what? A float tank. Float? Yeah. Have you not heard of float? Uh, isolation tank? Yeah. 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 Oh, fun. Yeah. 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 And that's all. 
It's so salty. That's a salty. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. So it suspends you on the surface. Yeah. Yeah. I got to wonder, though, in an hour of doing it, because you're in the water for an hour. Oh, actually, well, no, that wouldn't be a problem because your our skin um, blocks chloride absorption. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so exposure exposure to the skin isn't the same. You will um, sodium ions will pass through your skin. Yeah. But chloride won't as mu- as much. Like your skin, our skin regulates it. It's part of why we um uh, we evolved as humans. Um, and I talked about that in my book a little bit too. Um, there's a theory that we evolved on the coast of Africa, and like. Mm-hmm. And it's the reason why we don't have hair um, because we uh, are evolved to give up hair. Hair is not a good insulator in water, but fat is. And so we evolve. And it's why most um, ocean going mammals have no hair as well. Yeah. Cause it's metabolically expensive for the purpose. So we lost our body hair in order to grow more fat. And that's why also why we're softer. Like if you look at our yeah. other primary relatives, they're super ripped all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like apes. There. Yeah, we have that extra body yeah. fat to keep us warm when we were um, foraging for clams and shellfish in the in the shallow oceans. Um, so we have this natural affinity for mm-hmm. salt water, um, which I think is one of the reasons why we also do require such high levels of sodium yeah. to be healthy. Um, but yeah, so you can be you can be you can do salt baths and stuff like that, and you'll get the salt uh, pass through the skin, the sodium pass through the skin, but not so much chloride. So. Oh, yeah. yeah, I love the ma- magnesium salt with methylene blue and some uh, B- B3. I think I use B3. I just make like these weird baths with just like a bunch of rain. <laughs> I'm Is like, it good? yeah. Oh, anything, any skin problems you have? I had, I had some weird, okay. So I was doing all the idea lab supplements for a while. Yeah. When they contained, uh, uh, what's DMSO. the toxic? DMSO. So, yeah. Here's what I'm pretty sure happened. I was taking way too much DMSO and it ruptured most cell linings in my body or at least made them fragile. From that, it started to create something called purpura, which is uh, spring hay fever. So I started to get like, not boils, but like weird purple dots all around my body. And it would get real bad sometimes. And I was like, I had no idea. And mind you, we just ended our lease and moved into a motel for a month because we had to live somewhere so i was sharing a bed with trent uh, a twin bed that was the hardest for a full <laughs> month. and i'm like fucking i have like, no idea yeah i have no idea what's going on with me so i one had to heal my gut because they uh, gave me uh doxycycline at like 250 milligrams and it destroyed me and i couldn't eat anything so at the same like, time you're dealing with that yeah, because yeah, then I – okay, so uh, I had to, like, rewind this whole story. So I thought it was bed bugs originally. Yeah. Because – or there was some beetle in Jacksonville where I was the weekend before. It started to expose itself. So I was like, maybe it's this. Yeah. So then, because this is just who I am, I looked up online, like, what could I take for bed bugs? And all this stuff was like, go to the doctor. And I was like, I'm not going to go to the doctor. So I go on Amazon, and I found what they give horses to get rid of bed bugs or worms. And I was like, oh. I'll just take some of that. And it was like this apple flavored. It was actually apple flavored, mind oh. you. But it numbed, it numbed the mouth a little bit. So I took this tube of stuff and then it made me break out in acne and I never get acne. So then I went to the doctor because I'm like falling apart. I have no idea what's going on with my skin. Yeah. And like now I'm getting acne and I don't feel good. It gives me doxycycline for the acne, not for my actual like stuff that was going wrong. Yeah. Which then killed my stomach. Yeah. But I think my stomach and the DMSO were the reasons that I was getting spring hay fever, which is something that like you're supposed to have as like a genetic condition, they called it. Then I learned that routine in lemons helps to repair the cell lining mm-hmm. lemon juice of what DMSO was affecting. So I was doing that while repairing my gut. And did and that work? That worked yeah. in conjunction with the baths, which just, because like, my stomach was so bad that I'm pretty sure like my skin was sensitive to anything. So, uh, I like wash my, uh, clothes in a friend's washer and dried it. And they had uh dryer sheets in there and I didn't know. Yeah. And I like, it was the word, like everything. Yeah. I put sweatpants on and like my whole legs were covered in red dots. I was like, what's going on? So I like immediately did one of the baths, put a couple essential oils in it too. Gone like right away. Um, yeah, when I use those products, it dropped my thyroid temperature, I mean, my, my 
my body temperature really bad. My, I think it affected my thyroid function. Yeah. I don't, I don't like those products. I, I try to warn people. It's, it's not just that how they're made. Mm-hmm. It's that those kinds of products are not part of our natural physiology. Yeah. Like they're not, our body is not built on taking hormones. <laughs> Our body is built on B vitamins, yep, minerals, and vitamin C. Basically, those are the only things that our body really and well, oh, sorry, nutrient. Like we obviously need calories, carbs, yeah. protein, <laughs> but um, like vitamins and things like that. Our everything on our body runs on B vitamins, vitamin C, and um, yep. minerals. And um, taking those things for some people might have beneficial effects. But they're, what they're doing is they're then making up for deficiencies in other mm-hmm. areas and they're not healing. The, that's why um, taking thyroid for the years that I took it, it really helped fix my symptoms. And anybody who is having severe thyroid problems should probably look into doing thyroid um, medication and stuff like that. It can help a lot, but it won't. those kinds of things won't heal you in the long run because they're mm-hmm. not addressing the underlying yeah. cause. And then, of course, with those kinds of products, you can get into really serious trouble. Um, <laughs> as of what they're made of and yeah uh, throttling throttling t3 we did that what we throttled t3 for a little bit just to try it like where you do i forget the girl's blog but it's her site's like turn it's like a program her whole site so it's very interesting where like each article is like a chapter but it was like building up starting at like one grain two grain three grain and building it up and yeah. then bringing it back down to repair like traumatic uh, stressors that would have affected the thyroid. I'll never do that again either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't need much. Yeah, you don't need much teeth to be. I would bite off the tiniest little crumb of the pills that I had. Mm-hmm. And that was more than enough. Because um, uh, our, our body, if you don't know our body, um, not you, but people watching, yeah. uh, doesn't make large amounts of thyroid. Like you, what is it, four milligrams or micrograms? It's uh, like yeah, it's a very micrograms because micro. they measure it in grains. Uh, yeah, I've I've never understood what the grains were actually. <laughs> no. I, I can do it. Um, the dosages that you get are like way too in the pills. Like the one I was getting was twenty five whichever units it's in, and um, we only need like four yeah. a day. So um, taking more than that doesn't really help. Um, when you had that experience, so were you exposed to iodine at all? I was so I, this is before I even this is when I was like anti iodine because I was like it's not good oh, for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, iodine iodine in excess amounts can cause that purple, lesion. but that's in really really high doses. And um, I don't know though because I didn't know my water. I didn't know like anything back then. Florida has just toxic water. We yeah. literally left and they're like, "There's a carcinogen in the water and where you were living." And I was like, like it came out in the news. I was like. Yeah, our hangovers were the worst hangovers ever. <laughs> Only there. Yeah. And then the DMSO probably made your body more permeable to that as well. So. Yeah. Well, we we were trying everything. We bought like all the supplements because we were like, let's see what everyone will do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've done that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I like I hurt my health. There was one time when I was experimenting with calcium and stuff that I I almost had to go to the hospital because it made me so ill. I took a dose of um, eggshell calcium and a big dose of glycine mm. and the acid in my stomach made those form into calcium glycinate. And it, um, my body was not used to having that much calcium. And I started having, um, mild seizures. Like my body was shaking and I, mm. I took some salt because I knew that sodium would help counteract that and some vitamin E. And if it didn't get better in five minutes, I was going to go to the hospital <laughs> and it started to like come down. I was like, okay, I just need to like rest and this will go away. But, um, if that happens to you and you're watching the calcium is not, don't take large amounts. It can be mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I've done stuff like that. And then I, in my book, I talked about my experience with it was Vertol and um, yep. St. John's Ward and it almost shut down my heart. So, you know, yeah, that's why. And then those experiences though, taught me that the solution to all these things is based in how we function as an, as a natural human being. Yes. But the reason all these exotic medications and things don't solve our problems permanently is because they're not part of our physiology. They might influence it a little bit, but they're not, they're not based on how we operate and and always going back to what we are as an organism, how we evolved. Um, the, uh, we'll always usually bring those kinds of solutions. Um, I wanted to say real quick, a really, really relaxing bath 
um, too. If you put iodine in the bath, um, really? that's one of the most relaxing things I've ever done. And it's really weird. And I can only think that maybe it has some sort of direct function like we evolved when we were swimming mm -hmm. in the ocean, evolving in the ocean environments, um, that our skin maybe absorbs iodine like really well for that reason or, or it has some other function if it's absorbed through the skin rather than taken in internally. So yeah, so you add like maybe like 50 milligrams of iodine to a bath, like it feels, yeah, it's really good. Oh stuff. yeah, I'm gonna do that. I love, I'm still, I'm like addicted to the iodine bandwagon where it's just like, I'm like. Yeah, it's fine. It can be, if uh, people listening, it can be a double-edged sword if your body can't handle the stimulation. Mm -hmm. It can cause, like you can, you, most people, if they're having hair loss problems and they haven't adequately um, addressed those underlying conditions, like I talk about in my book about mm -hmm. raising your metabolic rate, taking a lot of iodine can overstimulate thyroid production and you can actually like lose some hair in the stress response. It's not permanent and it's not really that harmful. Like your body can, easily get back from it and it probably will have uh more benefits on the long run by restoring your um hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis but which rely on iodine but um you can avoid that first by doing the necessary prep work of raising your metabolic rate and and, and if you have a problem like that just reduce the dosage and don't take it as often what so earlier we talked about marijuana for a minute i have no idea how does it affect metabolism that's like one thing that i'm like completely me like we would always be like maybe if we smoke maybe it'll go up and then we like feel our hands and feet and we're like i don't think it changed um wait does that mean you've never tried it then no i've oh i've tried it a bunch but i just i could never oh. tell if it was actively influencing just like ghrelin and making like the hunger hormone go up or if it was actually like hey reduction in stress Sometimes I get super stressed, but you know, that's yeah. Nice. Well, okay. So yeah, it's a little complicated because there are two different factors. There's the, um, there's the, um, what's the relaxant part of it called? So uh, indica and. Oh, no, sorry. Oh. The, actual, the actual chemical. It's like. Oh, uh, ghrelin and leptin. No, no, no. Part of what's the actual chemicals that are in T like THC is the psychostimulant. And then there's mm -hmm. another one that is the, um, the part that actually relaxes you. Uh, so, uh, but I can't remember what it's called. It's like the cabinet. The yeah, yeah, the CBD. Can yeah. So yeah. that part does relax you. Like, I think it. I think it. It, it like turns off your overactive nervous system. Mm. Makes you feel good. The other. The problem is though that pot, and I don't know um, off the top of my head which part it is. I think is the THC raises your cortisol like crazy. Ah. Uh. So yeah, that's so that's where marijuana has this tricky um, double nature, where it has a lot of therapeutic effects because it raises cortisol. It acts like a steroid on people, and it can help their body overcome certain. And the combination of the relaxing part, where it's turning off your excessively active nervous system, which is contributing to your pain and suffering, mm -hmm. then you raise your cortisol, which is a steroid that then helps your body repair some of the damage that's also causing that pain. But then the problem comes in that too much cortisol can make you paranoid and it can also reduce <laughs> and it can also stimulate weight gain yeah. and in sleep. So that, that's why marijuana eventually stops working for people because as your metabolic rate drops, oh. um, I'm more susceptible to the increase in cortisol, which basically then ends up inactivating, I mean, invalidating any benefit that you might get from it. There was yeah. a point, even though I was so, so sensitive to marijuana, I still probably am. I just haven't had it in a long time. Um, uh, uh, I, I had to stop smoking it. it, it even a t even a tiny tiny bit would make me feel really really agitated mm -hmm. and restless at night instead of sleeping. And it's because your metabolic state eventually comes to a point yeah. where it can't respond to that cortisol stimulation, and so then it becomes a negative. So it can interrupt if you're trying to build muscle. Mm -hmm. It can prevent that. It can hasten aging. Um, it's not the smoke. It's the it's the increase in cortisol that does that. Mm. Um, but if you are taking care of your metabolic health, you're eating enough calories, you have enough sunlight exposure, you have enough um, minerals and nutrients and B vitamins, then marrow, then then its use would be um, net beneficial, and not be uh, not be as much of a problem. But if you're if you're exhibiting symptoms like yeah uh, muscle loss and insomnia, you you probably have to stop it yeah. in order to uh, prevent the harmful effects of it. So. Yeah, it's like another one of those band-aids. What? 
it's like another one of those band-aids for if you try to go to sleep with it yeah 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 the only one that i've seen that like is very pro metabolism is lsd yeah i've always been curious to try it i i would be open to trying it because uh in like the small doses it's really really therapeutic and it can like permanently lower your serotonin production and stuff like that mm-hmm. which would have uh, which has long-term benefits i from what i've seen have you seen um hamilton's pharmacopoeia on- oh yeah yeah, I've watched my, almost all of his stuff. <laughs> so, um, but I, so I, but, and this has a lot to do, like, if you don't know, like I have a chapter on alcoholism and addiction mm-hmm. to care for it. Not just like, not just like therapeutic, like dealing with it, like the yeah. reason it happens and how to take care of it. Um, has shown me in people like that have like long-term drug problems, um, like things like LSD and stuff, they can have beneficial effects when you use them and even long time afterward but again going back to the point that medications and things like that are not part of our physiology mm-hmm. it's why they don't permanently fix people and like as a, as a person gets older and has metabolic problems those can end up like they you know they need more lsd later to do yeah, have this yeah. effect and those kinds of things yeah so it, that's not a nature of the drug it's the nature of our physiology like we you are missing something um, probably B vitamins, probably you have the gut, um, gut microbes that are affecting your health. Totally. Um, taking care of those things permanently does those. And then stuff like LSD, like that could help. Um, so when you have alcoholism and, and addiction, you have this state where your rafe nucleus in your brain is constantly mm-hmm. making more serotonin and promote, and then that promotes more melatonin all the time because of the trauma that you experienced when you were a child. Um, not just um, social and environmental trauma, but yeah. also nutritional trauma. Like there's a there's a com- there's a balance and combination between the two where they those those factors where they <clears throat> oh yeah influence the development of an overactive parasympathetic nervous system through this chemical called acetylcholine. And um, so when you're a child and you go through that, you end up developing a brain that is highly sensitive to mm. um, environmental stressors and nutritional stressors. And so I, in, in my chapter, I talk about how you deal with those issues through nutrition and light therapy. Um, and drugs and alcohol, they help to temporarily um, mm. deal with those um, issues, which is why people can develop dependencies. It's a neurological disorder. So, you know, um, so something like LSD can permanently alter that trauma. Well, permanently, like really long term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But without supporting the actual physiology with proper nutrition, light exposure, mm-hmm. and inhibiting like gut bacteria and stuff like that, um, that it'll only be a temporary effect. So then you okay. end up like having more problems later or longer term. If you are taking care of your metabolic health and you do address those things, then yes, yeah, something like LSD could permanently wipe out any um, residual um, uh, physiological uh, alterations. Yeah trauma and i'm interested to try that i would probably do that in like yeah it's i mean like because i have one friend who doesn't respond unless he takes a lot um it's interesting because like i've similar to if you don't have the background or like you take it and you don't do the work to get your health right it's very similar to what you learn on it where it's like whatever it reveals to you it's like if you don't do that work you just keep seeing that stuff over and over again you always have to like actually okay cool like this is what i'm either struggling with mentally or like got to figure out it's like this is what i need to do yeah i like mushrooms better for that but i haven't tried those i was a real boy scout i like i <laughs> i i started i only smoked, started smoking pot when i was like 24 i had my first drink when i was like 19 mm-hmm. um and then but then i became a raging alcoholic so it wasn't like it did me any good um somebody in my family once said uh they were like really lucky that they didn't like try those things and i was like you smoked pot three times in high school like you tried it yeah like, you just don't have the neurological structure to be susceptible to addiction um yeah. like uh yeah i i don't think i really do i'm a really high responder to things so i'll like take something and yeah. then feel it right away like it like let's say like lsd or pots but like if you eat a brownie it's supposed to be like an hour or like lsd it's an hour 25 minutes i know what's gonna happen yeah no i had a i had a really traumatic um 
incident with a pot brownie because I didn't know that it took that long to kick in and it contributed to me getting into an accident uh, when I was oh. intoxicated a long time ago. I wrote a whole, um, my yeah. account on him, I have a story, I would tell a story. Um, but yeah, it, <laughs> it was, luckily I'm alive and I didn't hurt anybody yeah. else. I was really lucky, but um, uh, yeah, I didn't know that pot brownie, I, like, because I had, I had one, I was like, it's not doing anything. And then I had <laughs> another one and uh, on top of that, it. I had been drinking too. Yeah, and it, it just made me like, I, I completely lost consciousness. Yeah. Oh yeah. Bad. So okay. So we're kind of like transitioning. You don't end eating edibles, they go for like six hours. You're high. Yeah. Seriously. I mean, that's how. That's what LSD. It's at least that long. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But with so not acid, but fulvic acid. Have you done any research on fulvic acid? I read about it a little bit, but um, yeah. uh. I, but no, I haven't um, looked into it very much. That's something I'm always so curious about because like uh, Dr. Tennant and uh, um, why can't I remember the name of the book right now? Uh, I brought the book up last time. The one where I got hooked on iodine from, but he talks about how fulvic acid is like one of the main things that was in the soil, that was in the food that helped provide all the minerals and everything. Oh, so yeah. I always I wonder like if like, because a lot of things like playing with the pro hormones and stuff like that, which is like so outside of what we would be, I guess, exposed to previously or like in a natural healthy environment. I'm wondering if fulvic acid is something good to supplement with. I, I took it for a little bit. I did like it. I felt it benefits. Yeah. Um, but I need to do more research. Um, you know, yeah. Um, it sounded interesting to me. It also sounded maybe a bit snake oil ish where, mm people promising a lot of benefits from it. And obviously we just, we don't go out in nature and dig up fulvic acid and eat yeah. it as part of our nutrition. But I think you're right in the sense that it probably contributes to our the nutritional chain. Um, I was really interested by, I was watching the Monty Don's Garden show on Netflix. Have you, do you know uh-huh. Monty Don's gardening hero in the UK? Awesome. <laughs> um, he was uh, helping somebody do a garden and he, um, they were planting a tree and they added uh, fungus mycelium to the root ball. Yeah. And planted it. And apparently this is like, everyone knows a lot of people, everyone, a lot of people now know, I mean, we've known for a long time that um, fungus are integral in um, plant uh, physiology. Fungus help to break down minerals and nutrients in soil and make them available for the plant. So they'll like grow along the roots oh. of like, bushes and stuff like that. And the tree that they planted, like when they planted it, it was just like a little stick with a couple leaves. And he came back like six months later and it was like, it looked like it had been growing for like four years. It had so many leaves on it. Really? And even he was surprised by how full it was. And, you know, something, fulvic acid could be maybe like related to fungal and bacterial activity in the soil and making minerals and nutrients available for, um, not for us or for plants do that and then we and plants take advantage of it but that probably is more appropriate for like plants because Mm -hmm. like plants grow into that material they absorb those nutrients and then we then we eat the plants because um and fulvic acid might make those minerals bioavailable for us but like a really good example is like silica yeah like silica as it comes in like supplements and stuff is really harmful Mm -hmm. not really harmful it's not toxic but it's aggravating it it, it, it gets absorbed into your body, even though people claim it's too big of a molecule to do that, which is absurd because our body absorbs giant <laughs> molecules. Um, uh, but silic, um, um, silica, did I say silica acid? Yeah, yeah. yeah Sorry. Uh, silica. 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 Silica is harmful. So silica is, is the natural mineral form that's unreacted with biological stuff. And it's a really, really, really hard mineral. And it, if it gets into your body, in its raw form, the body cannot, unlike calcium and magnesium, which we can actively absorb and manage, we don't do that with silica. And so your body just has to like physically push it out. And while it's in your body, it actually aggravates your um, nervous system. It can aggravate your skin. When I first started taking lots of supplements and I had, I had really bad eczema when I was really sick on my cheek here and, and taking anything with silica in it made my eczema just explode. Um, I met, I was working with somebody too, who was taking supplements with silica and they would get nosebleeds all the time. So silica, silica rips up your tissues yeah. and it's really not good. 
plants will take silica and combine it with an acid and it becomes silicic acid. And in that form, silica is actually really helpful. It can actually work to detoxify your body of mercury and lead. Wow. And I advocate, I, I adver, advocate using it um, in treatment for erectile dysfunction because mm. we can have um, um, aluminum in our nervous system that can actually block um, neurological impulses to your reproductive organs and, and, and make sex feel dull and uh -huh. uh, satisfying so um so taking silicic acid in that form silica in the form of silicic acid actually helps in that case whereas in raw, raw form so fulvic acid might also make things bioavailable but it's more like the plant function of those that's probably the safer better more nutritional and appropriate way and and you know certainly like cultivating agriculture and ground with that kind of stuff makes plants more nutritious and i think the the whole um, fungal mycelium thing also has a lot of implications with contemporary agriculture mm -hmm. um, tilling ground and stuff kills fungus and so plants don't absorb nutrients like the, the reason a lot of mo modern agriculture that foods are not nutritious is not necessarily because the soil is um absent of nutrition Bad. yeah yeah, it's because uh, they're absent of fungus. Mm. Um, because fungus fungus help plants um, obtain minerals and nutrients. And when you're constantly tilling the ground and exposing them to air and, and sunlight, they actually it actually kills the ones that are responsible for that. So I would advocate more for like um, pursuing uh, really holistic nutrition yeah. rather than taking things like fulvic acid that aren't necessarily they I might I don't have enough knowledge on it to yeah. say either way, but but I do know that you would be better off with just more nutritious food probably then. Yeah. On that side with fungi, are you a advocate of like chaga and uh Oh, I've, yeah, I've used chaga a lot actually. I've never found a way to use it in a way that was like specific for anything. Mm -hmm. I always feel better when I take it. Um but it's also it's again one of those things that like um it might provide you some nutrients mm -hmm. that are helpful, but it's not a cure all because a cure all yeah. Vitamin C, B vitamins, and minerals are cure-alls. So you get you get enough B vitamins either through healthy gut function or from using um, something like brewer's yeast. Yeah. Um, constant uh, supply. I can't do it. Brewer's yeast. Do brewer's yeast. So have you done any milk? No. Okay, it's, that's the thing. It's really uh, weird. okay. Trent Some just shoots reason, it, and what? like Trent just shoots it, and I'll walk up and like try to shoot it, and I'm like. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't need this today. I have all the supplements. <laughs> um, for some reason, if you mix brewer's yeast in milk, it tastes more like peanut butter. Oh, okay. Well, I'm doing it's that really because good. I can't do the yeah, other. If you, but if you mix it in water or like something acidic, like orange juice, it's revolting. So um, I can't even take it in water. Yeah, but if I take yeah. it in milk, I actually love it. Like it actually tastes a lot like peanut butter. Oh, cool. There's probably something with the um, calcium in the milk that does a reaction and causes that. Yeah, so it doesn't taste like you already threw up. No, and I would recommend. <laughs> I mean, like, like, like brewer's yeast, especially in like um, a lot of brew, most brewer's yeast is grown on wheat, mm -hmm. and that can have allergenic um, properties. And the wheat grown kind tastes more bitter. Oh, okay. Um, there's a brand I ha I buy Blue Bonnet's brand that they they have a product that's grown on sugar beets. Oh, and that one tastes even better it tastes better and it also is not i've never had allergic issues from it brewer's yeast is slightly estrogenic so it can contribute to bloating in your gut if you already have a lot of bloating but that's okay because taking it is going to help you overcome that tendency to bloat. it's not estrogenic enough to cause mm -hmm. like in the net the net benefit from all those b vitamins yeah. will be anti-estrogenic then okay so and, and i've been using it now for what like three years and i probably two and a half years and i still like i absolutely love it so awesome yeah okay i gotta give it a go on milk i can't do it and yeah. <laughs> regular like uh i'm just always like no. he's like oh do you want some brew juice i'm like you that's that's for you man so. yeah no i know some of the things that i have like sodium acetate doesn't taste that great but if you put it in orange juice it's fine that's fine yeah um calcium acetate makes me vomit almost every want to vomit almost every time i have it and yeah. so i I've advocated for it and it helps, but like it actually is so disgusting to me. I, so, you know, and horseradish is really good with the steak, but like yeah. if you try to like eat it raw, it's just. I like, eh, I like horseradish a lot. Or like I'll go get wasabi at uh, 
any yeah. Japanese steakhouse, and then I'll just take it and press it to the top. Me, I mean, Trent will do that. We press it to nice. the top of our mouth. Yeah. <laughs> see, like one, who it hits first, because you could just see it immediately. But two, so it like goes up the nasal cavity. Yeah, yeah. It's invigorating. Yeah, it's yeah. Then we're it like, is kind of fun, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you take too much, if you take too much of it, some people were like, I was really ignorant to that when I advocated it for the first time. Um, I assumed that people would be familiar with horseradishes, like <laughs> not like down it by the spoonful. And but some people were so excited about what I had discovered that they treated it like it was a, an inert um, supplement. <laughs> and they um, caused themselves lots of discomfort. There's no reason to be discomfort, to have discomfort. That's the thing with my approach. Yeah. I'm really big on hedonism. I'm really big on like, you know, like signs of suffering are usually signs that you're doing something to hurt yourself and yeah. not beneficial, like uh, opposite the way that we've been taught. And um, so gen- generally you just, you should never be comfortable when you're improving your health. Yeah, no, so I agree. To take. So what's next for Nathan Hatch? Um, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm fantasizing about moving to a small town and marrying a farmer. <laughs> yeah. I'm tired of the city and the EMF and I miss open skies and animals and fresh air. Um, I don't know if that, a part of me too, I'm really uh, fickle, but I like, I love writing and I, um, I like LA, like it's, it's a fun city. Um, and, uh, I feel like if I move to the farm, to the country, I might be giving up on my dreams. on just one set of dreams that I have. There's other things like I want, I love agriculture and farming and I want to like, do a lot more work in like kind of like more natural holistic and farming stuff and maybe open a bakery or something like that. Oh, nice. Um, but I don't know. I'm kind of like directionless at the moment. My, now I finished my book now. And so like, I've got that, behind. that was my big thing for a long time. So now I'm just kind of like figuring out what the next step is. And obviously like I'll be, I need to do something where I'm more interactive with people. And like, we were talking about those. Yeah. Teachable things that might be something good for me to pursue next where i um am more visible and interactive with directly with people in order to like help promote this kind of stuff so something like that i'm not sure what it is yet but awesome we'll see. Well, i'm excited and i'm going to keep people uh, up to date before we sign off where can people find you oh uh fuckportioncontrol.com um that's my blog and my book and um i'm on instagram at um n-a-t-y-e hatch nate hatch n-a-y-t-e hatch at, um yeah and uh and on facebook nathan hatch awesome well thank you so much for doing this this is awesome we covered like a vast array of topics yeah, <laughs> cool. yeah. touch you later adios